Uh, before I uh, begin my opening remarks, uh, I would request uh, our trustee, uh, Mr. Lalit Basin, to honor our guests and present uh, to His Excellency Moshe Alon as a token of our appreciation for his being here, uh, Ashal. And next, a welcome for Excellency Ambassador Carmen. Uh, Your Excellency Moshe Alon, the Honorable Minister of Defense of the State of Israel. Uh, it's indeed, sir, a, a proud privilege and an honor for the Observer Research Foundation uh, to have you here with us. Uh, for the sixth R.K. Mishra Memorial Lecture. Uh, Mr. Daniel Kalman, Ambassador, distinguished guests. Uh, we have with us here uh, Mrs. Renuka Mishra, Renuka Ji as we call her, who has been guiding us affectionately all along. And on behalf of her and our trustees, Mr. Lalit Bhaseen, Mr. Baljeet Kapoor, I welcome all of you uh, to the sixth in this series of lectures. Uh, this lecture series was actually conceived of not just to commemorate uh, the memory of Sri R. K. Mishra, but also as a testimony to this man's belief that think tanks and civil society, institutions within civil society such as think tanks, can help both build and cement partnerships for an India which is global and globalizing every day, every year. In fact, the life of Sri R. K. Mishra, if you look back at it, the founder chairman of the institution, was a continued quest for progressive dialogue, for sustainable reconciliation for the long term, of striving for excellence, to achieve greater understanding, which would lead to peace both within and without. And this constant quest to bring together people of all kinds, people who belong to different spectrums of society, in an effort to help shape India, help shape an India that ultimately would be at peace with itself and at peace with the world, that was his ambition. Uh, born in 1932, uh, Sri R. K. Mishra went on to become the editor of uh, the Patriot and The Link, both very influential newspapers. But beyond his editorial capabilities, he was always a natural mediator. Uh, becoming an MP in the Raj Sabha, he served the National Integration Council under the then Prime Minister, uh, Sri Narsimha Rao. And he shouldered several critical roles during the Vajpayee administration, including very critical track to uh, back-channel diplomacy with Pakistan. Uh, always passionate about the scriptures and Indian philosophy, his last writings uh, dealt almost exclusively uh, with the Vedas and the Upanishads. And most importantly, his love for India's tradition and culture extended to West Asia, to Israel, far beyond India's borders, with whom every Indian actually has a deep emotional linkage. He always was a very keen observer of the region and a perpetual optimist of the region's ability to overcome its history and its past. And as for the institution uh, which he founded, uh, the year 2015, sir, is very special for us. For this marks 25 years of our institutional journey. And it is only fair that we use this opportunity to look back at how it all began uh, with Mr. Mishra at that time. The creation of ORF, sir, 25 years ago, was during a period of intense economic churn in India. For in 1991, India was a country encumbered by and uh, 
struggling under a closed and controlled economy, rooted in political ideologies of a bygone era. And given the political legacy of those times, it was difficult to reconcile the extremes of opinion in the policy space that were actually fragmenting and pulling the political space in completely different and diverse directions. Under, those, under that kind of a situation, it was very, very difficult to focus on the big picture. So this was a time when the creation of a minimum common ground for reforms was most needed. And in these troubled times, when, the ideo when ideologies, political stands were opening deep schisms and chasms in thinking on public policy, ORF began as an institution that had the ability to bring together some of India's greatest but, deep, but deeply divided minds round one common table onto a climate platform to agree onto a common agenda that would help catapult the country into the new century. The institution thus owes its genesis in all these years with this desire, it was his desire, to create a public policy institution outside of the government at a time when many would have found the thought a bit amusing. So just as India was unshackling itself from its insularity and stepping forth to engage with the world, RKM recognized the growing role of independent thought leaders and think tanks and the space they would come to occupy in the new emerging spaces within Indian discourse. Now given these origins, ORF today even prides itself on not being an advocacy organization. We do not do advocacy. It continues to be an organization that can bring people together with diverse backgrounds, opinions, and ideas around one common table. An organization that through informed discussion tries to clear the clutter that often abounds in public discourse and help incubate ideas that form the basis for informed policy decisions. It is basically a platform uh, to promote concord and break gridlocks. And gridlocks, there are a plenty. For anything that can be said about India, the exact opposite also holds true. To understand the country, one needs to understand and feel for its diversity, its plurality. India cannot be understood from New Delhi alone. And this was something which, which Mr. Mishra understood very well. In his own lifetime, uh, he saw the ORF grow into a foundation with operations not just in Delhi, but in Mumbai and Chennai. And he also laid the building blocks for the Kolkata Center, which today has become a vibrant entity in its very own right. And so building on these foundations, the ORF has continued making its modest contributions to the local, national, regional, and global debates around us. In a way, RKM's life ambition could very well be the national objective of nations like Israel and India. And of all countries that are today responding to the challenges posed by the irrationality, by the barbarism of contemporary times. And facing it by holding aloft the torch for democracy and pluralism. Israel too, a country born amidst turmoil and strife, stuck perhaps in the most troubled region of the world, has much experience with handling irreconcilable differences in the neighborhood. It has not only taken these in its stride, but as a nation flourished and developed for over six decades now. While there may be occasionally some discordant notes and debates in India on the overall politics of the region where Israel is situated, the previous decade has seen the constituency of friends and admirers of Israel grow continuously in India. And the relationship has progressed into a one which today can be called a very settled relationship. We at ORF sir, see this relationship as pivotal to our mutual needs and aspirations. And therefore, it is fortunate indeed that we have you here to speak today to us on this most important of global partnerships. For in you, we see not just a soldier who has experienced the horrors of war and risen to command the Israeli Defense Forces, 
but also the statesman who continues to serve his country and make it safe. Importantly, sir, you have been and you are a great friend of India, and we hope that your visit marks the beginning of a new phase in our blossoming bilateral relationship. So, sir, with our sincere thanks for taking the time off from a very busy schedule to spend this afternoon with us, uh, let me invite you to give us a vision for a strong Israel-India partnership and what it implies for the global world order that we find ourselves in today. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I am privileged and honored to be here today, and I would like to thank, thank you very much, Mr. Joshi, for hosting me in your annual event. Uh, I am privileged and honored to be here in an official visit as Israeli Defense Minister. Actually, the first official visit of any Israeli Defense Minister. I have been to India before, even on private occasions, which I enjoyed very much. But yes, this is a historic visit, by all means. As we used to have our relationship, security-wise, behind the scene. And I'm here using the opportunity of Air India 2015 show in Bangalore to be there yesterday and to be here today in Delhi to meet the Prime Minister and other ministers uh, as a demonstration as well as an opportunity to enhance the relationship between India and Israel. There are many similarities which we find between India and Israel. We were born 1948 after a British mandate. Democracies, but when it comes to our size, we can't compare it. Israel is a tiny country, 500 kilometers length, about 100 kilometers width in the best case, 8 million citizens, that's it. But we do share, first of all, common values, as well as common interests. And we, found, we have found a way to cooperate even behind the scene when it comes to security. We do cooperate openly on all areas, sophisticated agriculture, trade, high tech. But we found a way to cooperate on security, defense, in a way that I witnessed yesterday in Bangalore spending some time, not just in the Israeli pavilion, in the Indian pavilions, witnessing the cooperation, the products, as a result of cooperation in research and development, in joint ventures, procurement. And now, with Prime Minister Modi's initiative, Make in India, discussing the best way to implement this vision which we respect very much. And we believe that uh, by finding the way to enhance the cooperation for the benefit of the two countries, uh, the sky is the limit. And uh, we are here 
to say that when it comes to security cooperation, first of all, unfortunately, we are both experienced, and we, Israel, we are flexible to offer whatever can be offered in order to meet the Indian needs. Israel is a tiny country living in what we call a very tough neighborhood, the Middle East, encircled by countries which aimed to destruct it, in the beginning by conventional warfare, armed invasions to our land, on the day of the declaration of our independence, and since then at least twice. The last time was Yom Kippur War, 1973. Later on, our neighbors, unfortunately enemies, realized that there is no way to defeat the Israel Defense Forces on the conventional battlefield. And they moved to either subconventional warfare, terror, rockets, even missiles, targeting deliberately our civilians, not dealing with the IDF, as it happened last summer with Hamas from the Gaza Strip launching rockets deliberately, 4,500, against our civilians. But we were prepared. We developed a system, which is called Iron Dome, to intercept these rockets, to avoid casualties as well as damage in property and, of course, economic damage. We fought for about 50 days without causing a significant damage to our country. And there are those who aspire in our region in order to avoid conventional type warfare. They aspire to acquire military nuclear capabilities. It was Iraq in the past, Syria, 2007, and of course, the Iranian regime. Having said that, it means that we have to meet almost all kinds of challenges security-wise. Non-conventional warfare, conventional warfare, sub-conventional warfare. As a tiny country, we found technology as very significant in order to overcome our disadvantages in territory, in the size of the population as well. And that's why we claim that we found a way to change disadvantages to advantages, not just in the military. Another good example is shortage. As we are short of water, and in the time water was a casus belli, reason for war, between us and the Syrians, when they tried to divert the sources of the Jordan River, this is not the case anymore. We are not short of water anymore. We are not dependent on nature. By developing the salination system to supply drinking water and recycling water for agriculture. We are even short of land. That's what we have to, we have to find a way to have agriculture in the desert. I live on a kibbutz in the desert, in the southern part of Israel. We grow dates, melons, watermelons, onions, sweet potatoes, and so forth. We have very big cow shed in the desert, almost 50 centigrades in the summer. Because we have no choice. This is the case when it comes to security. We have no choice. This is the best incentive. 
And we are ready to share our experience, our technologies, our know-how, as we do already between the defense ministries, the Indian and the Israeli, and of course between our defense industries, government to government, as well as the private sectors on both sides. Looking to the Middle East, a short to the horizon, what we see in the Middle East of today is chronic instability. The only constant in the region is a change. Changing situation almost every day. Looking to Egypt as an example, Mubarak had to give up his governing. President Morsi leading the Muslim Brotherhood and today, the President General Assisi. In three years, Libya doesn't more exist. Tribal conflict, no central regime, not effective governance whatsoever. Syria, ongoing civil war. Unfortunately, more than 200,000 casualties, to include many civilians, women, kids. Endless war. We can't see the end. Bashar al-Assad controls only 25% of the territory. The entire is controlled by all kinds of militias. We have a free Syrian army militias considered as relatively moderate. We have Islamic militias, Jubat al-Nusra, following Al-Qaeda ideology, and ISIS, or today IS, Islamic State, on both sides of the old border between Iraq and Syria, which is irrelevant anymore. And Lebanon in a low-scale civil war, especially Shias versus Sunnis, Shia led by Hezbollah, Sunnis, ISIS, Jubat al-Nusra, you name it, and Iraq. Shias versus Sunnis, the Kurds enjoy autonomy, offended now by ISIS, even now in these minutes, in the area of Erbil, ongoing internal conflicts, chronic instability, for a very, very long period of time. But on top of these challenges is the Iranian regime, the Iranian threat challenge. We claim that the main generator and instigator for instability in the Middle East of today is generated by Iran. First of all, we claim that radical Islam, the rise of radical Islam in the region, started on the day of the Iranian revolution of February 1979. The success of the Iranian revolution to impose their way and to make Iran Islamic Republic led by the Islamic law, the Sharia, was a source of inspiration encouragement, empowerment to radical Islamist jihadists, all kinds of, in the region and beyond. Not incidentally, Hezbollah emerged immediately after the success of the Iranian revolution. Not incidentally, Al-Qaeda emerged in the 80s. Not incidentally, Hamas in the Palestinian arena was created in the 80s. And Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood movements all over the region were empowered, whether it's in Egypt and other countries. But this regime, which aspire to acquire military nuclear capability, 
is very active in undermining regimes in the region. You can't mention even one conflict in the region in which this regime is not involved. You can find the Iranian regime fingerprints in Afghanistan. Not all elements in Afghanistan are, support, are supported by Iran, but there are certain elements in Afghanistan which are supported by the regime. Supported meaning money, weapons, terror know-how, and training. <clears throat> what for? Not to allow strong, stabilized Afghanistan. And this is the case with Iraq. Since 2003, Operation Iraqi Freedom, the Iranian regime is heavily involved in Iraq by supporting mainly the Shias, but even certain Sunni elements. First of all, to fight each other, not to allow strong, solid, stabilized Iraq. <clears throat> and today, in a way, the Shia government in, in Iraq is an Iranian puppet. <clears throat> in Syria, they are heavily involved. Iranian general was killed recently on the Golan Heights. What Iranian general has to do in the Golan Heights? They are heavily involved in supporting Bashar al-Assad in one hand and confronting certain elements in Syria not to allow the Sunnis, which are the majority in Syria, to gain any power. Lebanon, Hezbollah, clear and obvious, can't survive without this Iranian support. A militia which is a state within a state with 100,000 100, rockets and missiles. What for? What is the role of the Lebanese government in this case? If the Hezbollah can decide to go to war against Israel, to send troops to Syria, to be involved in Iraq, where is the Lebanese government? And recently, this regime actually took over Yemen by supporting the Shia minority in Yemen, the Houthis. Again, support meaning weapons, money, terror know-how, and training. So you can say today that we have Iranian regime in Tehran, we have Iranian intervention in Baghdad, Damascus, Beirut, and Sana. And of course, they support Palestinian terror factions to fight us. Again, by weapons, terror know-how, training, and money. This is the Iranian regime before talking about the military nuclear project. That's why we insist in Israel that this regime should be stopped. And while negotiating by the P5 plus one, with this regime about the number of centrifuges, a deal which is going to be maybe to, to be concluded in the near future is going to be a bad deal. And no deal is better than a bad deal. Why? Because with the charm offensive of this regime, there is no political isolation which was a significant tool against this regime. Not talking about creeping sanctions, which might be lifted, and this is the Iranian regime objective in this round of negotiation. <clears throat> this regime might gain power, rehabilitate the Iranian economy, gaining confidence to intensify the rogue activities, not just against Israel, against Western interests against moderate Sunni Arab regimes in the region, as they try to do everywhere, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. We have to learn the lessons of history, and that's what we try to do. And for us, lessons of history, first of all, to learn the region. Not to be romantic or naive by naming the new geopolitical chaos, earthquake, whatever, neither as Arab Spring nor as Islamic Winter. We see more colorful situation in which there are also opportunities rather than 
threats. The new geopolitical division in the Middle East, according to our analysis, is first of all having the Shia radical axis led by Iran to include Bashar al-Assad regime, Hezbollah, now the Houthis in Yemen, and other minorities here and there. We have Muslim Brotherhood axis, two countries, Qatar, Turkey, very interesting, member of NATO, part of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, axis, supporting Hamas, the Tor organization according to our perception in the Gaza Strip. And we have Hamastan in the Gaza Strip. Gaza Strip is a Palestinian political entity governed by Hamas. Although there is unified government now, it's just a facade. Hamas is controlling the Gaza Strip. So this is the Muslim Brotherhood axis. We have global jihad element, elements all over the region. The global jihad camp, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Jubat al-Nusra, Ansar Bet al-Magdas, you name it. And we have the Sunni Arab camp. Consist of Egypt, Jordan, we share peace accord with them, and other parties which we don't share peace accord with them. Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Kuwait, actually the Gulf states to exclude Qatar. We believe that the West, as well as the State of Israel, share common interest with this on the Arab camp. That's an opportunity. Without ceremonies, without conferences, even without having peace accords. In this chaotic situation, one of the lessons that we have to learn is to avoid not just ignorance, we have to know the region, to avoid patronism. We believe that what we witness now in the region is the collapse of the nation state system, which was imposed artificially by Western leaders after World War I and World War II. World War I, Sykes Picot. World War II, the post colonial era. But the idea to create nation states in a culture in which the loyalty to the tribe, the loyalty to the king is more important than any artificial national identity is crucial. And this is the main reason, we believe, why we witness the collapse of the nation state, the artificial nation state, and the survivability of the monarchies. And we try very hard not to intervene in their conflict and not to patronize them. We don't claim that democracy in the Middle East should be imposed by elections. And we are great supporters of democracy. We wish to have more democracies in our region. It's not going to happen in the near future. Why? In a society which many elements in society sanctify life, sanctify death, Sanctify this. Can you talk about human rights, women's rights? If lives are not considered, I'm not talking about all the elements in the region, but now talking about radical Islam. This is the case. And you can't impose democracy just by election. We have very bad experience with Hamas winning the elections imposing non-democratic regime, killing the opposition. One person, one vote once, no second chance. And that was almost the case in Egypt. That's why 30 million Egyptians went to the street to demonstrate against Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood regime. So we try to avoid ignorance. We try to avoid patronism. And today we enjoy relatively calm situation security-wise. Here and there we have hostilities, hostilities which we have to deal with. But generally speaking, relatively calm situation. 
because we believe we are realistic, we don't allow wishful thinking to dominate our way of thinking, and looking for interest in a region which anyhow is going to be chaotic, not stabilized in the coming future. And to conclude, I would like to go back to, to, go back to our relationship. As I said, we believe that our relationship are strong because they are based, first of all, on common values and then common interests. And I believe that Israel and India respect each other. And by saying it, I'm very optimistic about the opportunity of implementing Prime Minister Modi's vision, making India in all areas, but under my responsibility in the security and defense field for the benefit of our two countries. Thank you. Your, ex Your Excellency, Mr. Yaalon, Your Excellency, the Ambassador from Israel to India, the dignitaries, trustees of ORF, seasoned uh, diplomats, ladies and gentlemen. I am a lawyer, sir. Happen to be a trustee of this very prestigious institution. Therefore, what has struck me as a lawyer, listening to your excellent speeches, that both countries, that Israel and India, they are committed to the rule of law. That is, in the long and final analysis, that is what matters. And I'm pleased to inform you that legal support is required for any, any activity undertaken either by the states or by the private sectors. And we in India, who are in the legal profession, and I happen to head some of the organizations, we are in constant touch with the Israeli Bar Association, and we have excellent understanding, cooperation, and ties with the Israeli Bar. That itself ensures that there would always be a commitment to promote and strengthen the rule of law in our two countries. Your Excellency rightly pointed out that both ancient and new at the same time, our two countries value the rights of man, encourage individuality and freedom of thought and expression, and seek to make the world a better place. This is both a privilege and a great responsibility, as our two countries are tasked with the force for good and stability in a complex and, if I may add, somewhat chaotic neighborhood. As you pointed out, 21st century holds many promises for the bilateral and our role in shaping this century. You will forgive me for sticking to the stereotypes, but our defense relationship has come to epitomize the close cooperation between our countries. In this relationship, I can confidently say we have reached an unprecedented level of trust when Prime Minister Netanyahu said in no uncertain terms, and I quote, sky is the limit. Israel's defense cooperation presents us not just with the prospect of technology transfer, but also of an alternative business paradigm focusing on subsystems on small and medium sector industries. It presents us with an alternate paradigm of strategic and tactical autonomy. Clearly, sir, the Israeli engagement with India 
is about so much more than just war and security, about which you have spoken so elaborately. It is about our youth, about our poor, about our farmers and our youth. In short, it is an aspirational relationship that has its eyes firmly focused on the future. Your Excellency, I thank you for your, for your brilliant, educative, informative, thought-provoking, and straight coming from the heart speech, the address which you gave to us. And we look forward to deeper and broader relationship, one that touches the sky and perhaps beyond into the space. I also thank His Excellency the Ambassador for being with us today. And I thank all of you for participating in this historic 25th uh, anniversary of Observer Research Foundation, which was set up by one of the great citizens of this country, um, my very dear friend, and in a way mentor also, late Shri R.K. Mishra. Thank you very much.